Start that. All right. Whew. So we had a little break, kind of coming back to things after a while. Um, so I wanted to switch topics a little bit. We've now kind of gotten to the end of the stuff I was going to cover out of Canis de Silva. So the rest of the course is going to be a little bit of kind of a grab bag of topics that I think are interesting. Uh, and one of the ones I wanted to talk about, I didn't actually write the title here, is about hypercalar manifolds. And there are a few different ways to explain these. I'm going to start with one that actually gives us an interesting perspective on some other structures we already talked about. So whenever I have a Riemannian manifold, I have a unique torsion-free connection, which is compatible with the metric called the levi chivita connection. So this is a, a canonical way of taking a path and lifting that up to a path in the tangent space. Some people will call that covariant derivative or parallel transport. So you can parallel transport vectors along paths. That's what a connection does for you. Um, and we can look at the holonomy group of this metric. So that means that, should have drawn the picture here, but I can now, I have some point P. I look at all the paths that start at P and go around some loop. Um, and parallel transport about each one of those gives me a linear transformation from the tangent space at P back to itself. So when I start multiplying those all together, they generate for me a subgroup of the general linear group of that tangent space. Um, and there's probably some discussion to be had about, do you actually want all closed loops? Do you only want ones that are trivial in pi one? I think actually in different situations, you want different things. I'm not gonna really worry about the pi one thing, but just kind of keep that in mind. Um, all right, so what does this group look like? If I just take some random metric that I know nothing about that's kind of generic, I would expect that I get, well, not quite almost everything um, because parallel transport preserves the metric. So I've got to get things that are in the orthogonal group of that metric, but I would kind of expect I get almost everything in there. Um, again, with the proviso that if my manifold is orientable, that mm, I'm always going to get something which has determinant one and never something of determinant minus one. Okay. So I sort of get this generic behavior of I'll either get O for a non-orientable manifold or SO for an orientable one, unless something non-generic happens. So one obvious kind of non-generic thing that might happen is that I might be able to take my tangent space at the point and write as, as a sum of two sub-representations, right? Because it's an O, my holonomy group is uh, always compact. And so my representation is always completely reducible. If I can find an invariant subspace under it, the orthogonal space gives me a complement. Um, and if that happens, then actually, at least locally, I can write my manifold as a product and my metric, the actually interesting thing here is that the metric is induced by a metric on each of the factors. So this gives me a way of splitting up my tangent space that's invariant under parallel transport along all paths. That's what it means to be invariant under the holonomy group is that I can do parallel transport along any path. And it doesn't matter what path I do, I always get the same decomposition at every point in my manifold. And I can use some theorems from differential geometry, that's Frobenius theorem about uh, integrable distributions to say, oh, actually, at least locally, those two pieces are tangent to the leaves of a foliation, and my manifold is locally a product. 
Okay, so if you want to ask kind of interesting questions about homonomy, you can reduce to the case where the group is acting irreducibly. And one possibility is you get O or SO. Okay, that's interesting, but it's that's kind of the generic behavior. So otherwise, if you have irreducible uh, holonomy group and there's sort of a special case called symmetric spaces that we want to just kind of put off to the side. Those, there you can get any compact group coming up as a, a holonomy. That's kind of its, its own special world. So we're gonna just keep ignoring those. But if you, if you put aside that case, then any other manifold where the holonomy is not the full orthogonal group or the full special orthogonal group is said to have special holonomy. And as the name suggests, this is actually pretty rare. It's an unusual sort of behavior. It's, it's hard to construct Riemannian manifolds that have this property. We do already know one class of these, which is that a manifold is Kähler if and only if the holonomy group is a subgroup of UN thought of as transformations in the tangent space. So let me let me say this a little more carefully. That that came out not as not as good as I would like. Um, so if we if we have an almost complex structure, um, So for a given complex structure, just on the, my single tangent space, TPM, TPM, I have the unitary group U, T, P, M, J, inside the orthogonal group given by the orthogonal transformations that are also complex linear for the complex structure J. So this is J linear. It's, uh, oh. Okay, um, and this is in fact in SO. All right, and the theorem, which is just rewriting what I had there, um, if the holonomy M is inside this unitary group for J, then as I said, right, anything that's invariant under the holonomy group, you can translate to any other point in your manifold by parallel transport. And because it's invariant under the holonomy group, you get a well-defined answer at the other end. Um, so I can transport J to an almost complex structure. And in fact, this almost complex structure is Kähler. All right, so that's a non-obvious, but I should, you know, feel like not terribly surprising fact. So this holonomy condition both forces the integrability of the complex structure and the fact that the corresponding two form you cook up using the metric and the complex structure is closed. So those are kind of two additional things. J is integrable 
and omega, which is defined by G, J, U, V is closed. And the converse is also true. So if G is Kähler, J. So if G and J are a, a compatible pair of a metric and a complex structure, which are Kähler, then the holonomy of M sits inside the unitary group for J. So this is sort of another way to think about what's kind of special about Kähler manifolds. Right? It might look a little random to introduce this condition that the associated two form is closed, but in particular, it's exactly what you need to get that the holonomy is complex linear. All right. So, well, if that's the case, then definitely the holonomy group is not all of O or all of SO, it must be something else. And again, kind of generically, usually what you'll get is that you'll get all of UN. That's kind of the, the most common situation. And again, you have to apply extra work to find a smaller subgroup. That's a, a rare thing and it's hard to construct examples of them. Um, in particular, you know, as I was preparing for this, I was reading some older sources about this and it's easy to find papers where uh, when the paper was written, extremely few examples of these things were known. Um, in particular, uh, I, I found a paper from 1966, which claimed there were no examples where the holonomy group was SUN for N bigger than one, no. Um, so at that time, they, they didn't know any examples where you got something smaller than UN outside of a few low dimensional cases. Um, but then, Yao came along and provided us with this remarkable proof that actually there are a bunch of metrics whose holonomy is SUN. So the condition that the holonomy is, is equal to SUN or contained in SUN is more often stated as the condition that the, reach, that the Kähler metric is Ricci flat. And it's a very famous theorem of Yao's that that's possible if a holomorphic volume form on your manifold exists. Um, and a kind of common theme here is it's actually incredibly difficult to, to write down what the actual metric is. So somehow a lot of the work in doing this stuff is finding some other condition that you can actually check, which will tell you that uh, this special holonomy exists. Okay, but Yao did come along. He did provide us with examples where the holonomy is SUN. So I now have kind of a, a reasonable looking picture. I have O and SO, I have U and SU. In both cases, that's kind of O is for the generic Riemannian case, U is for the Kähler case, and then the S comes in if you have some special condition, either orientability in the real case or uh, reaching flat in the complex case. Well, what are the other possibilities? And as I say, it's, you know, somehow like uh, in say the 60s or the early 70s, people had no interesting examples of other possibilities. But on the other hand, uh, in 1955, Berger had done some very interesting work kind of going at the other direction saying, well, which possibilities can we rule out? What can't the holonomy group be? And you know, you could imagine that the answer was it has to be O, U, 
SO or SU. But that's a conceivable theorem. Um, it probably seemed like a reasonable possibility in 1955 that that was the case. But sometimes you do a classification like this and it shows you, well, you already knew all the answers. And sometimes as you're doing the classification, you say, boy, I, I can't rule out this other case. Hmm, I wonder actually if something exists there. So uh, an example of this I really love is, you know, when Killing sat down to try to classify simple Lie algebras, I think he thought that, you know, SON, uh, SUN, uh, no, SUN, uh, sorry, SON, um, uh, G, uh, SLN, and uh, the symplectic group gave you a full classification. Those were the ones that people knew. But in fact, he tried to prove it and he said, oh, no, there are these other weird cases where things aren't working out. And he constructed five exceptional Lie algebras. Um, and you know, this is definitely related. Berger sort of found that there were some possibilities other than the ON and UN cases that he couldn't rule out. And so it seemed like, well, maybe, maybe the, these even more special holonomy things exist. Now, it turns out he, he didn't rule out all the ones he could have. There were, there were a few that slipped through that, that had to be ruled out later. Again, this paper I read from 1966 actually had the wrong list. It, uh, it listed as a possibility uh, spin nine, which is uh, not actually possible as a holonomy group. Um, but after a little bit of work, we end up with this actually pretty nice classification, which I think you could regard as, as closely related to the classification of semi-simple Lie algebras. And you know where it comes from, I think the best way to kind of organize this is you have uh, four alternative division algebras over R. You have R, which is a field, you have C, which is a field, you have uh, H, the quaternions, which is a division algebra, but not commutative. And then you have this weird guy, the octonians, which is eight dimensional. We discussed before when we were talking about almost complex structures. Um, it's not associative, but it's uh, what's called alternative. And what you find is, okay, R, R gives you ON and SON. Fair enough. That's kind of the the real world. C gives you UN and SUN. Okay, that's good. The quaternions give you two possibilities, which I'll describe more in a moment. So these are usually denoted SPN, but I want to emphasize that's not the symplectic group we've talked about. I'll explain in a moment. Those are linear groups over the quaternions, or unitary groups over the quaternions. Um, and then the octonians contribute this other one weird possibility, um, or sorry, two weird possibilities, which again, I'm not going to get into because they're, they're their own interesting story of spin seven acting on R8 in a funny way related to triality, uh, and G2 acting on R7. Um, and as I said, sort of the status of these guys is that, well, we'd known about ON, SON, and UN for a long time because we knew about Kähler manifolds and we certainly knew about orientable manifolds. Um, SUN and SPN, we had kind of a bit more of, but still not really any interesting examples until the 70s and the 80s. Um, basically, we needed Yao's work to check in most cases that the correct metrics existed um, because it was very hard to do so explicitly. And then these other guys, uh, examples of those were only constructed in the mid 80s. I think 84, Robert Bryant uh, constructed the first spin seven and G2 manifolds. Um, so it, it was really quite challenging. There was a period of like 20 years <laughs> when people or I mean, actually closer to 30 in the case of spin seven and G2 were People knew that Berger couldn't rule out this possibility. Um, and a lot of other people had, had done work on these. Jim Simons, for example, had kind of reorganized Berger's proof. 
but they also could, couldn't prove that these things actually existed. All right. So uh, I'm not really going to worry, worry about these Octonian guys because that just sort of uh, makes life kind of complicated. But I want to talk about these uh, quaternion ones. So as I said, SPN here does not mean the symplectic group. Uh, again, I'm, I'm copying the notation that most people use, but uh, it's sort of off by a factor of two from what I've usually written for the symplectic group, whether people write half the dimension of the space you're acting on or the dimension of the space you're acting on as a, as a real vector space is kind of a subject of discussion. But the other important difference is we're not taking the symplectic group SP2NR, we're taking the real compact form of this group. So um, when you have Lie algebras over the reals, they sort of come in these families. Uh, for example, GLNR and UN are two real forms of the same complex Lie algebra. Uh, GLNR is what's called the split form. It's the kind of least compact one. And UN is the compact form. And so uh, this SPN, that means the compact form related to uh, SP2NR. Uh, I think the best way to think about this is you should take SP2NC. So you look over the complex numbers, you look at an anti-symmetric non-degenerate form on C to the 2N. That's a big, very much not compact group, and you take the maximal compact subgroup inside of it. Uh, it turns out there's sort of a nicer description of it, which is it's Hamilton, uh, quaternion valued matrices, which are unitary. So, you know, the quaternions have a notion of conjugation. So if I have a, a n by n matrix over the quaternions, I can look at transpose conjugate of that. People would usually call it a star. Um, and so I can ask is a transpose conjugate uh, the identity or not? All right. And it turns out that that's sort of the, the missing group. Um, if you like, you know, if you know uh, Lie theory, right, uh, the simple compact groups have you know, some infinite series and some exceptional ones. And UN and SON, sorry, SUN and SON cover three of those sequences because you think about SON differently depending on the parity of N. And then this is the fourth series, uh, which is usually called C. Um, so I'll note here, the guys up in this list, this is not all of the compact simple groups, but it includes all the classical ones and then some of the exceptional ones. All right. So that explains this guy SPN. There's also this SPN times SP1. And what that, where that comes from is that because the quaternions are non-commutative on n component um, vectors in the quaternions, I can multiply on the left by n by n matrices, or I can multiply on the right by scalars. And those are commuting actions where the only thing they have in common is multiplication by minus one or by, I should say by real numbers, but if I make things unitary, the only overlap is one or minus one. So uh, if I have a quaternion valued <coughs> matrix, I can multiply on the left by A and on the right by some scalar V. And I can't write multiplication on the right by a scalar as multiplication on the left by a scalar. Those are different because the quaternions are non commuted. Um, in particular, the quaternions themselves have 
two actions of SU2 thought of as the unit quaternions by left and right multiplication. All right. So SPN times SP1 means the subgroup that's generated by the copy of SPN acting on the left and SP1 acting on the right, um, n component uh, column vectors of the quaternions. And so manifolds that have this kind of bigger holonomy group are called quaternionic Kähler, and ones that have this smaller one, just the left multiplication by matrices, are called hyperkähler. Uh, I'll just note here, uh, people don't always use these names totally consistently. Um, Usually people will still call something hyperkähler if the holonomy is contained in this group, but properly, for example, if it's you know, reducible. Um, so obviously it's interesting to find ones where the, the holonomy group is exactly SPN, but usually people will use the name hyperkähler to also mean things where the holonomy is a proper sub. All right, are there any questions? I know this is sort of a lot of material, um, but on the other hand, it's sort of, I mean, it's not so bad at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, we, we kind of have now had some experience with complex numbers showing up in our picture. Um, and this is basically sort of what happens if you take these kind of notions from complex geometry and start trying to work quaternions in instead. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to focus mostly on the case where M is hyperkähler. That to me is kind of the most interesting one. Um, and in that case, well, as I've now, the principle I've now used many times, if you have an object that's invariant under the holonomy group on one tangent space, you can transport that everywhere else. So I can make the tangent space at, into a module over the quaternions by this right multiplication. Uh, but I can turn it into a left module action using uh, taking conjugate. Um, so I can make the tangent space into a module over the quaternions. And that means we can take that H module structure and transport it to any other tangent space by Le the levi chavita connection. And so I get an, actually an action of the quaternions on the whole tangent bundle. You'll sometimes see this expressed as I have complex structures, I, J, and K. We use capital letters to emphasize that these are endomorphisms of the tangent bundle thought of as a real vector bundle, not, you know, any of these other, they're purely real linear maps. And they just happen to satisfy these algebraic conditions that I squared, J squared, and K squared are all minus one, and that IJ is equal to K, et cetera. Um, you'll sometimes see this last condition written as ijk is equal to minus one. Um, all right, so they, they generate a copy of the quaternions. Okay, so what happens when, when we do this? Well, the holonomy consists of special unitary linear transformations with respect to each of these three complex structures. So if I think about, if I sort of make I or J or K my preferred complex structure, then my uh, module structure over the Hamiltonians gets restricted to a module structure over the complex numbers. I have a complex uh, vector space and the holonomial is, is always going to be complex linear. Um, and actually you can check that it also has a determinant one 
the fact that you should think about here is that a unit quaternion acting on H, when I identify H with C2, acts by an element of SU2. In fact, that's an isomorphism between the groups SU2 and the unit quaternions. Um, so this is just some uh, higher dimensional version of this, that when you take an N by N quaternion matrix and then replace <laughs> Uh, each quaternion by the corresponding complex linear transformation, which is not going to be unitary. Uh, it's only going to be a, a skew Hermitian. No, Hermitian, sorry. Um, oh, I mean skew Hermitian. I think I do mean skew Hermitian. Anyways, um, the, the you know, corresponding two by two complex matrix, you actually get something whose determinant is one. Um, that's a little bit of work, but you should think of it by analogy with the fact that if you take a complex linear map and think of that as a real linear transformation, it always has real determinant. Um, right? It's determinant is the square of the complex norm of it thought of as a complex linear transformation. Um, like think about multiplying by a complex number. Right, the determinant of that thought of as a two by two real linear transformation is the square of the norm of the complex number. Um, all right, so this is just some upgraded version of that for uh, quaternions and complex instead. All right, so what that tells us is that with respect to I, J, or K thought of as a, an almost complex structure, this manifold is Ricci flat K. And of course, I have corresponding Kähler forms. So a symplectic form defined by take the metric and multiply the first entry by I or J or K. So I get three symplectic forms. Uh, there, there's a lot of threes that happen in this uh, Hyperkähler geometry basically because the imaginary quaternions are three dimensional. So you get a lot of stuff that's kind of parametrized by the imaginary quaternions. Um, and thus uh, you get a lot of threes. So, right, I'll just say often if you look in some book that tells you what hyperkähler metric is, they'll tell you what it means is you have three complex structures that satisfy the relations of the quaternions, and you have a uh, metric, which is Kähler for all three of them. Uh, the Ricci flat part is, is automatic, um, basically by this thing I said about quaternions. That being unitary for the other complex structures will force your holonomy to actually be a uh, determinant one. All right, and so this is equivalent to the definition of my holonomy group is a subgroup of what I was calling SPN, this quaternionic unitary group. Uh, and just so you don't get confused, right? When I have something that's quaternionic Kähler, well, I can only transport structures on HN which are invariant under left multiplication by unitary matrices and the right multiplication by unit quaternions. And a module structure over the quaternions is not such a thing. So if you're a quaternion, if you're a quaternionic Kähler, then you don't have an H action um, on your tangent spaces. You get like an H action only defined up to conjugation by unit quaternions. So those, those guys are weirder, like I said, it, I mean, it was also into the 80s before anyone had constructed interesting examples of these. Um, they're, they're pretty mysterious and uh, I think we still have pretty, pretty limited examples from them. All right, so how do we actually construct hyperkähler manifolds, right? So one of the reasons I'm focusing on this case is we can, in a somewhat reasonable way, 
write at least some examples of this. Um, one obvious example is you can just take HA, the quaternions. Uh, that obviously has an action of the quaternions on every tangent space. Um, and so if I just take the usual metric, if I think of Hn as identified with r to the 4n by the usual identification of the quaternions with r4, then the usual metric on here is Kähler with respect to ij and k. And so it makes this hyper Kähler, but with trivial holonym. So I'm using, again, this, uh, this sense of even if you're a proper subgroup of SPN, that's fine. I still call you hyper -K. And of course, you could construct compact examples of these by modding out by a discrete subgroup of R to the four. Uh, this gives you a, a huge number of different tori with hyperkähler metrics on them. But again, always trivial holonomy because I started something with trivial holonym. Okay, so these, you know, it's good to know about. Uh, they'll actually turn out to be pretty useful later, but they all have trivial holonym, so they're not that interesting. Uh, this is one of these things that I, I can never quite decide whether this is a definition of a theorem. So a compact 4D hyperkähler manifold and here I'm requiring that the holonomy is the full group SP1 is what's called a K3 surface. Um, and of course, there are some people who will give you a different definition of K3 surface and then it's a theorem that they are hyperkähler manifold. But it turns out that those are exactly all of the 4D Kähler manifolds, which aren't constructed by modding out by a lattice in the quaternions. Um, should say that there are many of these, right? The annoying thing about defining it this way is that doesn't help you actually construct them. But of course, you can go read out there. People will tell you about lots of different K3 surfaces. Um, the most natural examples are quartic hypersurfaces in CP3. So uh, one of these is given by what's sometimes called the Fermat K3, because it's a generalization of the equation from Fermat's last theorem. I take x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth uh, equals one. I look at that inside C3 and then look at its projective closure in CP3. That gives me a smooth hypersurface. And it turns out that has a hyperkähler metric. And as I said before, kind of examples other than these had to wait until the 70s or 80s to find them. So one of the ways of defining K3 surfaces is actually they're all diffeomorphic to each other. Um, and in higher dimensions, you can find uh, compact hyperkähler uh, manifolds, but there aren't very many of them. There are in fact only two diffeomorphism types. So there are, it's kind of a big family of hyperkähler metrics on these two diffeomorphism types, but um, other than that, there sort of aren't, aren't very many. Um, uh, one of these is obtained by uh, looking at the Hilbert scheme of points in a K3 surface. So the Hilbert scheme of any number of points in a smooth surface will again be smooth. And if the surface is hypertailored, then the Hilbert scheme will be hypertailored too. Um, and that's almost all the compact ones we know. There are these two weird examples in dimensions six and 10, uh, which are not the same as these. So we don't really know very many uh, compact hyperkähler manifolds. It's interesting. I mean, there's, there's like a lot to say about K3s. K3s are very interesting and rich, but somehow there's this 
whole world of people who tell you they study hyperkähler things, they only think about compact hyperkähler things, and so they know like four examples. Um, I come a big fan, so I, I shouldn't shouldn't put down K3 surfaces at all because they they are quite interesting. But there's there's not much else out there in the compact uh, hyperkähler world, but there are lots of non-compact examples, so there definitely are some out there. All right, given the timing, I think I'll take a break now and be back in a few minutes.
All right, I'm back. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, maybe a silly question, but like, do we know why dimensions six and 10 are special? Uh, no, no, I mean, those <laughs> okay. are two, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have a good explanation for it. I mean, just like those, uh, O'Grady just found these examples. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a bizarre thing, but, uh, yeah. I mean, compact hypercalar things, they're very poorly understood. Like, you know, are there any more of them? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's the kind of, there's no kind of systematic way of thinking about where do they all come from? I see. Uh, I was wondering, yeah. does, it, does it make sense or like, do people like um, study a slightly different situation where like, so you mentioned that one way that, you can define the hypercalar structure as like you have three complex structures and they mm -hmm. satisfy the quaternion relations. Like, do people look at this for like the dihedral relations for like dihedral group of order eight at all out of curiosity? Um, no, uh, you know, I don't, right. I mean, there's a good reason to use the quaternions, right? I mean, those aren't just kind of random relations that plucked out of nowhere. They sort of come from, you know, the fact that the quaternions are division algebra. Um, okay. Right. Like, if you did that with the dihedral relations, like the the algebra that that they generate would, you know, not be, um, uh, it wouldn't be a division algebra. Um, I don't know exactly what it would be, but. Uh, you know, it would be somehow genuinely different. Um, the, the reason I'm wondering is just like, I, I don't know, is there any relation at all to like, um, uh, like extra special two groups or something, just because that's the setting where I'm like, when I see quaternion stuff, I'm, I kind of wonder if there's like, also like a dihedral version because of that situation. That That's fair, but I, so, you know, somehow I think you're thinking about that just like a completely thinking different about the wrong context here because it's okay. It's not just that you have i, j, and k, right? You have all the linear combinations of them. Okay, yeah. So you really right? do need that more more algebra kind of structure. Yeah. Well, I mean it's it's just automatic because it's yeah. uh, because they're linear linear yeah. maps, right? Um so, you know, like part of what's coming up here is like the group algebra of the quaternions, of the quaternion group over R and of the dihedral group over R are different, right? They're, they're the same over the complex numbers because the representations have the same dimensions. Yeah, they have the right? same characters. Um, or the quaternion group, right? Like the, in both cases, right, you, you have the group algebra, you have a portion of the group algebra where the center acts by one, and that's boring, that's one dimensional representations. And then there's the part where the center of the group acts by minus one. And for the quaternions, that's a copy of the quaternions, the division algebra. And for the hedral group, it's a copy of two by two matrices over R which, you know, they both turn into two by two matrices over C when you tensor them with C, but there's a, a big difference over R. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think like, right, why, why the quaternions come in because of this classification, right? So there, yeah. there's like, there's an underlying Lie group hiding in there, which is like the endomorphisms of your tangent space that commute with that quaternion action. And there isn't like an interesting Lie group that you know commutes with the, uh, or there's at least a less interesting Lie group that would commute with a, a dihedral action. Okay, cool, thanks. So I like I understand why you went to those two groups, but I think that's like it's the wrong context to be putting it in. It's really something about the the division algebra of quaternions. Okay. Yeah, I guess I was also kind of thinking about like 
character table as being the mm -hmm. same type of thing. All right, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, but the sure indicators are different. Which, uh, it matters here because we're doing stuff over R. Um, all right, any other questions? Okay, great. So a kind of common theme with this stuff about special holonomy is that like it's really, really hard to like write down the metrics if you just try to like, you know, pick some coordinates and write them down. So it's better to rephrase things in terms of a more, uh, if you can rephrase things in some more algebraic condition, something that's easier to check. And uh, Yao's theorem is a great example of this. So just comment here. Uh, you know, Yao's theorem uh, reduces finding a Ricci flat Taylor metric. Which is really hard. Finding a holomorphic volume form, which is much easier. Can I just ask a quick question? Um, yeah. I'm sorry, maybe this is not the right time, but I was just wondering, can you get these uh, hyperkähler manifolds like algebraically as like quatern, you know, varieties over H in some way? Does that make um, sense? Like the way that well, Taylor manifolds- Well, you have to be careful about what that means. That's, that's uh, so in practice, no. Um, in, the the main reason is that like varieties over H don't work very well. So there is a projected plane over the quaternions, but that's actually quaternionic Kähler. Um, I think because it involves like dividing out the unit quaternions. Um, and that's about as close as you can get. So you know, what is true, and actually like this is this is kind of a good lead up to where I'm going, it certainly is a good strategy to think about complex geometry and try to think about like, how can I kind of get this hyperkähler structure out of a more complex geometry case, which sometimes but not always can be written algebraically. Okay. So I'll just say here, like with these K3s, well, the examples I mentioned are uh, projective varieties. Right. Uh, but there are some which are not. There are, there are K3 surfaces which are projective varieties. There are K3 surfaces which are not projective varieties. Um, there, there are just complex manifolds that have no interesting maps to projective space. Um, okay. So kind of both, both of those can happen. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get to that because you definitely should think that like, oh, hyperkähler things they have a, a complex manifold structure. So I should try to think about like, what extra structure do I need on a complex manifold to make it hyperkähler? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right, great. Just as sort of Yao's theorem as well, if something is Kähler, in particular, it's complex, what extra structure do I need for there to be a Ricci flat Kähler metric? Well. Turns out um, you need a holomorphic volume form. So, hmm, yeah, I'm sort of, I'm questioning the order in which I put things. Um, so yeah, let me not, uh, the actual calculation is lower down, but let me just say, um, 
on a hyperkähler thing, hyperkähler manifold. I can take omega j plus i omega k. And uh, as I say, I'll, I'll do the calculation later. That's actually a two zero form. So this is a complex valued form, complex valued two form. Obviously it's anti-symmetric. skew symmetric non-degenerate closed to zero form. So this is essentially a, a holomorphic symplectic form. It's a holomorphic form uh, to zero. Um, which satisfies the conditions we want out of a symplectic form. And so you might ask, well, is there some, something like this sort of Yao's theorem that tells us, okay, if you have a skew symmetric form and X, then you get a hyperkähler metric. Uh, and it turns out there, there is, a theorem that you can at least kind of slot into this idea. And the way to find it is to try to kind of think about all of the different complex structures at once. So uh, this is also kind of getting back to, to Sam's point um, or the, the point I was discussing with Sam. I have i, j, and k as complex structures, but actually I have a bunch more because if I take any point in the two sphere, and I take the corresponding linear combination of i, j, and k, that will square to minus one. So it's a, it's a unit imaginary quaternion. It squares minus one. So that guy defines a almost complex structure. And if you do a little bit of work, you can see that it's actually k um, by exactly the same argument before of like, the holonomy is in SUN for this complex structure. I mean, I said that that was true for I, J, and K, but it's actually true for all of these linear combinations. And it's the same proof every time. Okay. So I don't wanna just think about I, J, and K, or even worse, just about I. I wanna think about this whole sphere of complex structures at once. Um, and it turns out there's a really cool way to do this. So you look at the manifold M times S2. And you turn this into a complex manifold by, well, S2, I know is a complex manifold, it's CP1. And then the fiber over each point in CP1 or S2, I turn into a complex manifold using the complex structure that corresponds to that point. Um, so this is one of these things that like is easy, but like you have to kind of uh, think a little bit to get your head around. Um, so, right, if I have a, yeah, should have, should have left myself a little more space here. So again, I'm starting with the manifold M times S2 as an underlying manifold, totally boring, nothing interesting going on. When I take the tangent space at a point X zeta, and I know my zetas are not very good, um, of M times S2, well, that breaks up as a direct sum of the two tangent spaces, is the tangent space at X to M and at zeta to S2. Um, and I act on each of those guys separately with the corresponding complex structures where the complex structure in S2 is just the usual one. If you remember back when we talked first about almost complex structures, you can think of this as, you think of zeta as a unit quaternion and multiplication by that unit quaternion 
on the tangent space. That guy thought of as a subspace of the quaternions. So you can make this look even more tautological. Um, and then on the tangent space to M, you use the complex structure I zeta I defined above. So this gets me a complex manifold, which is called the twister space of the hyper-Taylor manifold. Um, so every fiber of this map down to S2 is a complex sub-manifold, and it's M with the complex structure I zeta over the point zeta. So this is kind of taking all of these complex structures and gluing them together. So then you get some kind of uh, you know, relatively easy arguments that if I take the projection down to S2, that's holomorphic. Now note, there's no holomorphic projection to M because I would have to decide what the complex structure in M is and I can't decide. I, I want to look at all of them at once, right? So there's no, no sense in which I can holomorphically project to M, but I can holomorphically project down to S2 just fine. And well, I, I can't project to M, but I can start at any point of my manifold. I can map S2 in just by taking pairs with that guy. And that gives me a section of the map down to S2. That's also holomorphic, um, right? If you look at this map, it preserves the decomposition of the tangent space into the direction along M and the direction along S2. And um, yeah, great. And the normal bundle to this inclusion, this is worth thinking about, but the tangent space at M looks like the quaternions, right? So, the normal bundle to this inclusion of S2, this is going to be a vector bundle of rank 4n on S2 or on CP1. And uh, it's actually the twister space of HN. Um, it's a 2n dimensional bundle. And I just take the direct sum of 2n copies of O of 1. So, I'm using the notation from the sources I was reading, but let me just emphasize what this is. This is the bundle, which is I take O of one and take two N copies of it. Think of that mapping down to CP1. So a holomorphic section of this bundle is a two N tuple of degree one polynomials and two variables. All right. And then finally, there's an antipodal map that sends M zeta to M minus zeta. And this is anti-holomorphic. So I'm using the fact here that the antipodal map on S2 is anti-holomorphic. And that when I go to minus zeta, right here, here I'm using that I sub minus zeta is by definition minus I zeta. So I'm putting a minus sign in front of the complex structure that's conjugate linear. So I'm, I'm just basically conjugating everything. So I'm getting an anti-holomorphic map. Just from the definition, if I negate A, B, and C, I'm also going to negate I sub zeta. So this is kind of is a cool structure. Kind of all of these things that show up are holomorphic, but then certain things you would imagine are there, like the projection to M. That's totally not holomorphic. There's no way to make sense of that. Um, all right. So what structures are left? Uh, to look for on this twister space. So this is getting the, the thing I kind of wished I had put a little earlier, but you know, you don't always, sometimes you change your mind about how you want to organize things as you're going through class. So 
a valuable sort of observation is if I fix one of my complex structures, I could say any i zeta here, but let me simplify here and say the guy who's calling i. Well, I'm gonna, I wanna forget about j and k, but I can still remember their corresponding symplectic forms. And I could get j and k back from those symplectic forms in the k -line. And I can think about, well, how do these play with the complex structure i? So if I take omega j and apply it to v i w, I can, using the algebra and the quaternions, I can rewrite i as j k. Well, w j of v j times something, that's by definition the metric applied to v something. So this omega j, because I have a J here, I can rewrite that in terms of the metric as G uh, of V K W. Well, that is almost by definition omega of K, but there's a minus sign that shows up um, using the fact that K is anti-symmetric or using the fact that K squared is minus one. Um, and similarly, if I do this to W K, I get almost the same answer, but now I have to take i and write it as minus kj, right? That's out of cyclic order. So I pick up a minus sign. So I get omega j applied to vw. And this may look like kind of a random computation, but this is exactly saying that if I take w uh, omega sub c to be omega j plus i omega k, and I apply this omega sub c to v i w, then I get i times uh, omega sub c v i w. Uh, and so this is telling me that omega sub c is a two zero form. It's a holomorphic complex valued form. So this is kind of one algebraic manifestation or at least simpler manifestation of being hypercalar that you'll have a Kähler manifold and it will have a holomorphic symplectic form. And uh, in general, it's much easier to find examples of Kähler manifolds with holomorphic symplectic forms. Um, and it's kind of more work to check that <laughs> it really is hypercalar. All right, but I was talking about the twister manifold. So I was sort of trying to take structures from M itself with one distinguished uh, complex structure and turn that into a structure on this whole family of the twister manifold. So it would be really nice to just say, aha, well, this gives me a two form on the fibers of Z. Um, which is a perfectly well-defined thing, right? You have the vertical tangent bundle on the whole space and you can take its, the second wedge power of its derivative. But I need to be careful because this guy, omega sub C, it depended on the choice of J and K, right? If I had replaced, if all I'm starting with is I, then, well, I chose J, K, but I could have just as easily chosen uh, J, uh, sorry, K minus J. And those would also satisfy the relations of the quaternions. And I would get a different omega C. Uh, I would get here that you know, omega C, omega K minus omega ij, well, that's what I had originally called omega c times i. So if all I do is fix one of the complex structures, I actually get only a, simple, uh, a holomorphic symplectic form up to multiplication by a unit complex number. So I need to be careful because I, if I want to kind of choose these all coherently, I have to make sure I get those scalars correct. 
And if you do a little bit of work, you'll see I actually like, I can't do it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work. What the way I sort of want to think about this is in order to get that complex symplectic form compatible with I zeta, well, we think of zeta, oops, as an element of the three sphere. And we have to choose an extension of that to a right-handed orthonormal basis. Um, and once we do that, then looking at, so alpha and beta are the other elements of the basis, alpha plus I beta um, is a vector with three entries dotted with the vector of the symplectic forms. So I take this alpha plus I beta and I use its coefficients as the coefficients for the different symplectic forms. Oh, sorry. Uh, some of the sources I've been reading used uh, omega one, omega two, omega three. So sorry, I meant omega I, omega J, omega K. So the way you should think about this is um, a, alpha and beta are actually a basis of the tangent space to CP1 at zeta. Um, and so you should actually think of this as um, a section, not of the two forms, but as the two forms tensored with the tangent bundle to CP1. That's where this thing is well defined. So um, on M times S2, we can think of this as a section of, yeah. uh, in algebraic geometry, we would write this as like T two zero with a brackets two or, and I should write V here because it's, it's vertical. Um, oh, sorry, T star two zero. Two zero vertical tensor with L of two, which is the tangent bundle to CP one. Um, this O of two, the other way to think about this is this uh, zeta, alpha, beta, that right-handed basis can be gotten from the usual right-handed basis by multiplication by some quaternion. But uh, I have this double cover of SO3 by SU2. So unit quaternions, there's a two to one map from those two rotations to SO3. And that, that two to oneness shows up in the fact that this is O of two, not O of one. Uh, what did you first. write here in usual what action of algebraic geometry? Oh, usual notation, I'm sorry. Oh, notation, okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, basically what's happening here is, you know, what this is telling me is if I try to choose the scalars on my symplectic forms on the fibers in such a way that they vary holomorphically, I'll be forced to have either two order one zero somewhere or one order two zero. Um, right, so what what O of two means is, um, yeah, that it's, you can think of that as sort of the line bundle whose holomorphic sections correspond to, uh, yeah, degree two things in the, the polynomial, the, the coordinates X and Y on CP2. Um, those things that are forced to have two zeros with multiplicity. Right. Uh, basically because a tangent, uh, yeah, and another way to say this is, you know, actually um, 
you know, defining one of these forms requires choosing a uh, vector field, a holomorphic vector field on CP1, which we use to get this, this normalization. Um, and a holomorphic vector field on CP1 has to vanish. Uh, it has to have two zeros with multiplicity. Excuse me. All right, so the structure that a twister space has is it's a complex manifold. It has a map to S2, thought of as a complex manifold. The usual structure CP1, or the, the structure that comes from thinking of it as unit imaginary quaternions, um, such that if I look at any fiber and any point in the fiber, I have a holomorphic section through that point. Um, and the normal bundle to that holomorphic section is, as I wrote here again, uh, C21, I can rewrite as O of one, take the sum two n times. Uh, I have a holomorphic section of so again, this wedge two of the vertical tangent spaces. So these are two forms on the individual fibers. And I have to tensor this with O of two, the tangent bundle, the CP1. Uh, and then finally, I have an anti-holomorphic lift of the antipodal map on a CP1, which is compatible with this data. Um, and if that's the case, then the space of holomorphic sections of this map, so maps back from CP1 up to Z. So this is just sort of a more invariant way of saying the points in all of the fibers, in each fiber, in any one fiber. I can actually identify all the fibers uh, using these holomorphic sections. Um, but it's not a holomorphic map, as we know, because the fibers have different complex structures. All right. So this space of sections is a hyperkähler manifold whose twister space is this guy Z. Um, uh, and I'll note here, so in some sources, uh, they say that you get a Riemannian metric. In some sources, you say, they say you get a, could get a pseudo Riemannian metric. So one where the bilinear form isn't positive definite. I think the difference is exactly what compatible with this data means. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm taking this statement out of a paper of Hitchin and some other authors, but I, I think they really snuck some sort of positivity thing into saying compatible with this data to make sure that you get a Riemannian metric. All right, so this is one way to construct hyperkähler metrics. Um, it isn't extremely easy to apply. Well, I should maybe say, um, even though this was sort of worked out a bit later, the key idea here is uh, by Penrose. So this really did originally come out of physics. Um, Penrose was sort of looking at ways of encoding these metrics for you know, actual physical interest. Um, the story was developed later by Hitchens and other uh, Hitchens and other co-authors. Um, yeah, maybe I'll I'll just try to do kind of one somewhat more interesting example, and then we can uh, save some other discussion for next time. So. Um, if you hang around with physicists, I mean, you know, sort of who do actual serious uh, quantum field theory, 
you'll often hear this term Taub net. So is this is like the slightly ridiculously named metric, the Taub net. And if you go read a physics paper, they'll write down some horrible formulas for what this hyperkähler metric is. But there actually is a sort of nice algebraic geometry way of constructing it by looking at this twister space. Um, but it's still a little bit complicated. So I, I think the, that'll probably be enough for today. So on CP1, I have an exact sequence of vector bundles where I can map the trivial uh, vector bundle, so functions, into O of one plus O of one by taking one goes to X one. So any other function would go to F goes to X times F and Y times F. Um, and uh, that's an inclusion and the co-kernel is O of two via the map that sends A, B to Y, A minus X, B. You can check that X, Y gets sent to zero by that. So I have this nice exact sequence of uh, vector bundles. And I can think of this in a slightly funny way. I can think of this as a, a principal C bundle, which is trivial, but not holomorphically trivial, um, over the total space of O of two. So what's happening here is I have the total space of O of one plus O of one. That's a three dimensional, or I should actually say six dimensional. I'm talking about real dimensions. Uh, complex manifold over CP1. And that maps into the total space of O of two by uh, this map I wrote here. Um, and this is actually a principal bundle whose fibers are given by the inclusion of this sub bundle. All right, so since it's a principal C bundle, I can take the associated bundle for any action of C as a Lie group with addition on anything else. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to use the following representation of C with addition. So this is a little bit weird, right? Representation means you're mapping into GL, in this case, one as a group, so a multiplicative group of non zero complex numbers. And I have a map from the um, additive group to the multiplicative group given by take exponential. Um, and I actually have a bunch of these because I can stick in a scalar lambda into that exponential. I'm only going to do this for a real scale. <clears throat> All right, so this gives me a new bundle mapping down to O of two, um, right? So I have this picture and now I'm basically sort of uh, uh, base changing. So I'm replacing O of one plus O of one um, with this guy Oops. The L lambda mapping that to O of two. All right, so this guy is also six. Uh, wait, do I have that right? Yes, six real dimensional. Um, so O of two is four, has four real dimensions, and this guy has a complex line bundle over it, so it has dimension two there. Um, all right, well, the, the dual line bundle comes from taking minus lambda, from taking the 
the dual representation. So I can look at these direct sums. That's so that's going to be real eight dimensional. And actually, I want to twist these by O of one coming back from CP one. So you should think about the. This is sort of some funny modification of looking at just O of one plus O of one mapping down to this guy, because this is the, the twister space of just H itself. So I'm taking this guy and doing some funny modification of it. Right? I'm writing it at this, as this principal bundle, then I'm taking every fiber there and replacing that with a new copy of C glued in in a different way. And this is very important, right? It's, it's glued in in a holomorphically different way. If you're thinking about like the underlying geometry, like the topology, uh, I think it's boring. Um, but the holomorphic structure is different. And the holomorphic structure is actually going to secretly encode this hyperkähler metric. That's how these twister spaces work. Okay, so I can consider this guy, um, but the dimensions are wrong, um, right? So this is, as we discussed, uh, oops, as dimension over the reals given by A. So actually I wanna look at a, a subspace inside here. So a point here, well, I have some point Z down here in the total space of O of two. And then I'm choosing two elements in the fiber in these two line bundles. So what did I call these? I think I call these R and S over there. So I have R here and S here. And those are both elements of the fiber over Z. So S maps to Z under the projection map, R maps to Z under the projection map. And I'm going to look at the sub variety in here where, so if I take R times S, the lambda and the minus lambda cancel out. Uh, and I get a section of O of two pulled back from CP1. And I want that to be the point in O of two that I'm sitting over. All right, so I'm imposing a complex equation. So now I get something whose real dimension is six. Um, and of course this maps down to O of two and thence to CP1. All right, so this is a slightly strange complex manifold, but a, a perfectly valid one. Note here, if I take lambda, some weird irrational thing, like it's not going to be an algebraic variety, but it's a perfectly fine complex manifold. And it turns out this is the twister space of a hyperkähler metric. And it's exactly this tog nut guy. Um, so this might seem a little strange, but believe me, you would rather try to understand this construction than to understand all the formulas in this top nut picture. Um, so for me, this was very satisfying. I have to admit, I hadn't seen this construction before. And I had been hearing physicists mention top nut for years and years and years. So uh, it, was, uh, it was good to sort of see that connected to something that actually makes some mathematical sense rather than just being like, oh, here are some strange formulas, which is you know, often what happens in this world. All right, so yeah, I'm over 2.30, so I will stop for questions and we can talk about other interesting constructions of hyper things on Monday. I have a question. <laughs> 
can can you say anything more about what Penrose's interest in twisters was? I mean, I know that they're. I, I, I've I've heard I've heard that he and the circle of people around him were like convinced that they were gonna, you know, like solve everything or something. And and but I don't know any more precise statement than that. Yeah, the short answer is no. I somehow didn't. I didn't find the right sources to to tell me about that. Um, so pro probably I should have a good answer to that question, but I I don't. Um, I mean, I think some of it is just like it's genuinely quite hard to write these metrics and you do computations with that. So it's sort of much better to kind of implicitly formulate them in this algebraic way. Um, and you know, I don't know these. Uh, these deformations coming from the, the twister structure have, have played a pretty important role in, in my work. So I like, you know, I, uh, I always like to see them, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't know exactly what to say about that. Okay, that's fine. I was just, just asking. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually have a question that's unrelated to the topic of class today. It's just a simple question, but why don't I just wait to see if people have other questions about hip hyperkähler stuff? Probably you should just go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. Yeah, it's a pretty simple question. Like I, I it's um, I, I've been reading uh, Kirillov's notes on the orbit method, which are spectacularly awesome, I think, and. Um, He's talking about polarizations, uh, which is, well, it's not important, but basically there's, you know, he talks about real polarizations as being like, there's a sub bundle of the tangent bundle that's integrable. So you, you get some foliation, right? So we, just the Frobenius integrability condition, which mm -hmm. I understand is fine. But then he talks about um, complex polarizations and he says, oh, now you, you can complexify the tangent bundle mm -hmm. and then a, a complex polarization is going to be an integrable subbundle of the complexified tangent bundle. And he says, here the integrability condition is analogous to the Frobenius criterion above or something like that. But I don't understand what it would mean for a, a, a subbundle of, of the complexification of a tangent bundle to be integrable because Frobenius integrability says, if I have two vector fields that lie you know, tangent to my subbundle, then their bracket has to be tangent to my subbundle. But if I have mm -hmm. two sections of of tangent bundle tensor C, what does it mm -hmm. mean to take their Lie bracket? Like they're not, you know. Like, well, I mean, uh, you, just, I, you just extend their Lie bracket like totally algebraically, right? Okay. If you have a if you have a Lie algebra over the real numbers and you tensor it with C. You get a Lie algebra over C automatically. Just extend the Lie bracket linearly. Okay. Oh, and then it just it's just formally what it would mean for the that condition to pass through. Okay. Because I was trying to think what it would mean geometrically. Like because when you take the Lie bracket of two vector fields, it's like you flow along one and you flow along the other, and then it's the difference between the two ways of doing that. What is the flow along the a, a set you know a complexified you know, a section of TM tensor C. Does that mean any, does that have an, a meaning? Yes, it's, you know, it's a map from C into uh, the space of Dippier morphisms, right? So you have a real part and imaginary part. And like, so you could like, um, so, right, you should think of a complex tangent vector, a, a, an element of the complexification of the tangent bundle as the tangent vector to a map of C into your manifold. Okay. Right? And so for example, like a map from C into your manifold is holomorphic if and only if that corresponding tangent vector is in the holomorphic part of the complexified tangent bundle at every point. Um, now, uh, what the, so I, I mean, I think you probably could try to make sense of what the Lie bracket means by doing this. Like it's, 
you know, you, um, you have two maps of C into the diffeomorphism group. And the question is like, do you have some kind of commutation between them? Um, but yeah, it's sort of, it, it, it is less geometric for sure. Um, okay. But somehow it's, it's analogous, right? Like, nice. yeah, it's, it's weird. Um, I agree about that. Um, I see. Okay, thanks. That helps actually. Now I, now I see what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if there was some secret thing that I hadn't that that he was expecting me to think about that I hadn't thought about. But I guess that you know, algebraically, it's uh, obvious what it has to mean. So, okay, thank you. And you know, somehow, right? Like the the integrability of a complex structure, right, means that locally you have holomorphic coordinate functions that give you an isomorphism to an open subset of Cn, right? And so, it, you know, it is sort of something about like, these guys don't mess with each other too much. Um, but I'm not sure I have like a, a, a good explanation. Um, Yeah. Because, yeah, we, I mean, we went through this whole thing with the nine house tensor. And, like, I think the right way to think about the nine house tensor is that you're taking the Lie bracket of two holomorphic vector fields and seeing if you get some interesting anti holomorphic component. <laughs> it's like exactly what the, what the nine house tensor is. is uh, uh, measuring, um, but yeah, well, exactly what that means geometrically is. Oh, here's a okay. Here's a random thing that question that doesn't make any sense. But since nobody else is is asking, I might as well. Um, about the the Nyenhaus tensor. Um, mm -hmm. Is that is there a universal Nyenhaus tensor? Does that make any sense? So universal. like, um, I guess like. In the sense that, like, you know, okay, this is weird. Like, you know, if you, um, there's sort of like a universal connection that you can, like, you can have, like, uh, if you, if you look at the universal bundle over, like, BU cross Z or something, um, um, you can put a connection on that, on that bundle so that any bundle with connection is a pullback of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the Narasimhan Ramanan theorem is what it's called, but, that, but, um, my question is that like, is there some, is there, yeah, is it, can you do that with the new house tensor? I don't know, it's a, it's a ridiculous question. Um, I would have to. Or uh, yeah, I mean, you would need some kind of like classifying space for almost complex structures, right? Yeah, right. Well, there is such a space, right? Isn't it just, well, at least, mm -hmm. at least uh, if you, if your almost complex structures need to be orthogonal, then it would just be like O mod U, right? O of 2N mod U, the space of complex structures on a vector space. And then maps into that would be almost complex structures. So I guess that's what I'm sort of asking is like, is there like a universal, some tensor on, uh, on that thing that is, yeah, I don't know, mm. <laughs> whatever. No, I, I I don't think that's I don't think that's quite right. You're somehow I mean it should be something you know some kind of like classifying space, right? Um, I'm not quite good enough with this uh, this kind of homotopic stuff for it, but it's yeah. I mean uh, an almost complex structure is like a reduction of structure group for your vector bundle from um, you know O of n from to a, U of n. Right. Sorry. From oh yeah o of, o of two n to, to u of n um, and yeah so there's some should be something fancy going on there. But All right, never mind, never mind. I, Anybody else I, something? You know, I worry because um, 
Right, it's not purely a statement about the tangent bundle as a vector bundle. Yeah, that's that's kind of the problem is that it, that it encodes something about like it wouldn't make sense for an arbitrary bundle. It's it has to be an actual tangent bundle, and like the brackets have something to do with the actual manifold, not just like an abstract. Yeah, I mean there's space. some so, something weird's going on. I don't know. Well, there, so there, I mean, there's a, a sort of formalism for, for fixing this, which is the Lie algebroids. Well, huh. so using the Lie algebraid structure on the tangent bundle. Do um, tell. <laughs> and so, like, it's like, okay, wait, is there some classifying, you know, so, like, yeah, is there some way of talking about, like, reducing the, the structure group of a Lie algebraid, and then what happens then? Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, right, probably there is some kind of fancy universal Lie algebraid where it makes sense to talk about the nine house tensor. Hmm. All right. Uh, would, uh, I'll go read about Lie algebraids then. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I think we should maybe stop the recording.